three, two, one. Welcome to the Light Forge. This is Adwukta. This is Murps, and we are back from our O3 uh, performance in the Red Bull Team Brawl. Uh, you know, all I can say is sucks to suck, but uh, I, I, I think uh, overall <laughs> we're still very happy. We had a great time, and uh, you know, huge thanks to Red Bull for uh, for the invite. Um, hopefully, uh, a lot of people got entertainment out of us losing. Oh my god. I just I'm just happy about uh King Dread. I think now nobody will bother me about King Dread's rating on our tier list ever again. And if they do, I'm just going to show them that clip. Um if you guys don't know what happened, this is like on on the front page of of Reddit during that that whole thing. Um we had we had planned out. And this is the this is you know, this is Hearthstone, right? So we had planned it out where we had a, like a two drop. Well, what do we have? We had um we had a two drop it traded with something, and then we put out a, a three drop that was the 4-4. Four, four. Nerubian Prophet. Nerubian Prophet. You can't just say, yeah, yeah. Nerubian so, Prophet. And they had a 3-2, and it was going into their turn three. And when we were dropping it, like, you know, Hafu and Mercer were like, ah, you know, like, I guess we have to drop it, but like... No, 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 no. no. Hafu was the one that was worried. I had faith. Oh, you had faith? Right. Okay. So Hafu yeah. was worried that they're just going to drop it, and they're just going to ping it away, right? Because they know our deck list, and we had, like, one Evolve and two Masters of Evolutions. Like, it was it was very risky for them to not remove it when they can. And they also had a one-drop in their hand, a, a fire or whatever, uh, that we knew that they had. So it was like they could ping it and then drop the fire or whatever, uh, firefly, and it would be all good. So they don't do that. They actually just, like, play out. They play a loot hoarder and a firefly. And we are really happy, so we immediately evolve it, and it turns into a king dread, and we're really happy, and then they play a wasp, and we're really sad. Yeah. So we didn't win. We didn't even get close to winning. Uh, but I think we overall, uh, you know, we did think, what we could. I'm going to say this. We, I think uh, we got, got the front page of Reddit. I think we got closer to, like, not winning. No one was going to win, by the way. If you, like, watch that from the beginning, and, you know, we were obviously paying very close attention to everything, it was very clear Kibler, Toast, and Sidonia were going to win the whole thing, barring, like, a huge ridiculous upset. They just had way better decks than everyone else in terms of their average deck. Right? A lot of these other teams had like one really good deck and then other decks that were like normal. And we had three normal decks. Or normal in terms of power level. Our decks were not normal. Um, but we actually came very close to getting second. Um, when we were 0-3'd, uh, if we had if won that game... If uh, I think both of our other decks would have been favored against their hunter. Yeah, we specifically yeah. chose the, the deck that was worse because we were just like, might as well end it now because all of them has to go through. Right, and uh, right. um, they only got the win off of our paladin because they like they did something into a consecration that was not whatever class well, they were playing. Oh yeah, no, no. it was uh, undercity huckster into peddler peddler zero mana consecration. Yeah, right. It's like yeah. that's the stuff that killed us. And our deck was heavily favored against uh, against their hunter anyway, and their hunter was the weak deck. So letting that through hurt. But even after that, we would have ended up with I think like a two three if we really wanted to play it out. But that rogue was a weak matchup against uh against their um their deck so we just went with it first and we're like well, let's do this first otherwise we're playing two meaningless games um but yeah no it was fun and uh it was a, a different format right it was sealed which is like half arena and half constructed um so what was what was like the most different about this tournament from arena from your perspective uh just a number of choices really um like you don't realize how sort of constricted you are in arena until you play sealed in which now it's it's you have this big sort of field this big sandbox and uh you don't just get one out of three choices right and you're stuck with it um you get to actually construct a deck you know i, I think sealed is just much closer to constructed where you have to look at the synergies you have to, you get to decide the curve like and curve is something that in arena, a lot of, like, I would say 90% of the time, you, you basically have, like, you know, very little control over exactly how your curve goes. Uh, in sealed, you can decide exactly how fast your curve is and how smooth you want it to be. Whether or not those cards are the best, you know, that's that's up for debate. But yeah, um, you'll always have enough two drops for your deck. Yeah. You'll always have enough three drops if you want. Like, real three drops, real two drops. 
yeah, real three drops. Uh, sometimes you'll just be running vanilla minions, but you know everyone was running those in uh, in the tournament, right? Like uh, Twilight Elders. I think mm -hmm. uh, basically like three out of four teams are just running those and saying because they're uh, spider tanks. Yeah, we'll take a spider tank here. Spider tanks um, are good. So that that was just a huge difference, and. I mean, specific to this tournament as well, you know, you, you have to start thinking about multiple decks, which is something that, like, you never think about. It's just this deck, you know, like, these 30 cards, but we had to start thinking about, like, the Conquest format as well, right? Um, in which case, you can't have a, a really, really weak deck. You can't just yeah. load two mm -hmm. decks or one deck and say... So if you guys don't know, the Conquest format, which is used in this uh, in this, uh, in this this tournament uh, and many others, it's just all your decks have to go through. Every one of your decks has to win. Right. Um, so because of this format, um, you have to make sure that you don't have an obvious weak link. Now, right. one deck is probably going to be, you know... Uh, it, it, it's impossible to build three like equally strong decks, but you have to make sure your last one doesn't lag behind significantly. Mm -hmm. So I, mean, I, I, I saw those. We had me. pretty even. We made pretty even decks with that in mind. Like the in the first round, uh, like what the paladin deck didn't go through, and the second one the shaman didn't go through, and in the third one the rogue was the one that we thought wouldn't go through, so we played first. So we don't know if the other two would have gone through, but higher likelihood. So we ended up with pretty even decks. Um, yeah, and that's... Uh, by the way, uh, if you guys are listening to this and you're like, why are you not talking about the arena? There's an Un'Goro meta. It's exciting and cool. Um, we're going to go right back to the Un'Goro meta. We're going to talk a little bit about it at the very end. But for the most part, this is going to be a more general kind of, kind of episode. Because, one, we haven't been playing the arena, right? We've been, like, scrimming for the brawl and playing the brawl. Um, we've only played a few arena runs in the past week. Um, so we're not going to go there. And for the second part, this is actually like a weird transitional period in the arena meta. Like we're getting out of this Angoro like new players, um, deal, uh, in which people were experimenting with cards and it's really kind of settling down and becoming very distinct. So in a week, it'll be very distinct. And at that point, it's just a better time to kind of talk about things. Um, okay. So one of the, like I used to play sealed back in magic. Uh, rather than draft, because Magic the Gathering had a, a draft and a seal. Those were their two main limited formats. Sealed is what you think it is. You open a bunch of packs and then you make a deck and then you play with it. Um, and draft is a more intense version of an arena draft where you actually like draft particular packs with your opponents. So whatever cards you pick, you deny them. And then you play against the same opponent pool. Uh, so it was, uh, it was much more intense. Um, but I always like sealed just because you can make these decks, right? Like we made a deck that was all about having two arcane giants come out for cheap uh, because we had a whole ton of spells in the rogue and it didn't really work uh, it was a fine deck but after we made it and we started playing with it I think it became very obvious that we made the deck too fast because the arcane giants are not drawn consistently enough because we didn't have uh, we, we only had uh, one card draw and then we all knew that we we all thought that, that it was a mimic pot so it didn't even draw two cards it drew one card and copied it and we were like oh we should have put the other mimic pot in as well that was like, a, all three of us just realized after playing just a couple games with the Rogue, because it was running out of steam too fast for the Arcane Giants to be fully used. And then when it the was. Arcane Giants got used, it was like, who cares that we saved like five mana on these Arcane Giants? We just need more stuff. So it would have been, I think, like a very powerful deck if we built it right. And we just, we did not build it right. And at the time, it wasn't like anyone was suggesting to make it bigger. Like, we just didn't, uh, if you watch the video, it, we were just like, we were not aware of how this deck was going to actually play out to the yeah. degree in which we should have been and um, it's part of the challenge with the 30 minute uh time frame and uh to, to give you some insight on sort of our strategy uh i think all three of us were definitely a little bit caught off guard because we did some theory crafting and every single team you know afterwards sort of shares strategy and mm -hmm. their theory crafting as well every single team came up with the conclusion that based on the packs that were offered um you should get uh, either a strong hunter or a strong mage or both, right? Likely both. Uh, likely both. Um, and we were the only team that didn't run both. Uh, no, no. So <laughs> we run. We ran neither. And I think all no, other sorry, teams ran hunter and mage. Two other teams ran hunter and mage, and uh -huh. one just ran hunter. Uh, they did didn't hunter run shaman. Mage. Uh, yeah, did hunter okay. shaman because exactly. you have an elemental package, right? You put it right. either mage or shaman. Mm -hmm. 
So we unfortunately didn't get an elemental package, which yeah, we no was so we were the only team out of the four that didn't get an elemental package, and we were the only team that didn't get hunter cards. Our hunter cards were total crap. So like, uh, think about how much Murphs likes to play hunter, and think about what it took for him to give up hunter. Because I like it's, Hunter, it's, it's very, fine. Hafu hated Hunter, and we just saw the cards, and even Merce was like, yeah, we can't build Hunter. I thought, because if we had a Hunter, I would have just, like, been so happy, and, like, my aggressive sort of Hunter, like, when I play Hunter, like, it, it, it's, t like, fine-tuned within me. I'm, like, calculating damage three turns ahead of time, and just being like, no, 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 we got a hero power here. Uh, no, and we ended up playing Paladin, Rogue, and Shaman, which are just, like, sad <laughs> yeah. i it's mean just... okay our paladin deck was sad but that's another story no shaman was pretty sad too because we've fine. mostly had neutral we had, like, cards double volcanoes there. yeah double volcanoes. and like a lot of taunts all right oh, by boy. sad you just mean you didn't go face a lot yeah okay basically so that's one of my things with this whole entire tournament every time and you guys don't see the audio for all of this but almost every decision that we were like looked like we were thinking a lot on it was me saying you need to hit face and then Hafu saying, like, yeah, I think we go for value. And then Merp siding with one of us. Like, almost every decision went something like that. And a lot of the times when we went for value, we got the value and it was good. And it translated into more damage to the face later. But it does mean that, like, almost, like, every misplay uh, that you guys could see because it was when Merp sided with Hafu. Because it resulted in, like, a little bit less damage, yeah. right? And, like, five turns later, we're like, oh, crap, if we only had two more damage, we would have won. And, you know, because I remember the tournament pretty well. Some of them were, were like, absolutely correct to go face. So I remember in our first series with PogChamp, for example, we killed mm -hmm. off a violent teacher when we shouldn't have, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I supposed to remember that. There was also one, though, um, like, you know, to, to give an example of the other side, yeah. when you wanted to go face with a wasp, but then they could have frozen yeah, the wasp. exactly. And we yeah. would have lost that game, actually, because of yeah. that. Yeah, because um, the wasp was very useful. Right. So, yeah, but, like, no one like no one would see that as a misplay because we didn't make that play, right? Right, right. So I'm not saying, like, oh, if you follow my plays, we would have done much better uh, because we, there would be many plays in which it would have screwed us up much earlier in the process to, like, actually have the board to deal the damage. Right. Um, but it's just interesting where the, where, um, where, where, like, the, the games were, right? Like, who was, who was, uh, doing what? And the very last game that we lost was a miscalculation on whether to use Snipe or to use Sap. And that was when Hafu actually wanted to go aggressive, and I wanted to pull back, and I was wrong. Like, that was just a misplay on my part. And Merp sided with me. Bad Merps. I actually wanted the sap too, but then Hafu changed. Hafu halfway changed. changed. I talked Hafu into it. You talk Hafu into which it, which I, I don't like, do very frequently, so I was kind of surprised actually. I was surprised by it too, so I was like, "Wait, if you talk Hafu into it, I'm like, all right, sure, I, I guess I'm on board now." And as it turns out, they had a huge punish for the snipe and kindly grandmother, and yeah. so we would you activated have... it immediately, basically. Which yeah, is and so like... we actually would have won that game if we had played sap. Um, yeah. At, the, at that time, instead of snipe, but there were reasons to play snipe. Like, it does set you up better for later on. You just have to recognize that, one, without Eviscerate being drawn, we'd lose anyway. And two, if Eviscerate was being drawn, the number of turns you needed was only three. You never needed more than three turns. On the third turn, you kill him. Yeah. Um, and that just, it, you know, there wasn't enough time for, for me to figure that out. Um, and if Hafu figured it out, she had been in that position. So, uh, yeah, anyway, it was a really interesting experience. Uh, I, I wish they showed more of, um, of our deliberation process than they did, because there were also announcers, you know, and the other team, of course. Um, but it was, it was really interesting. There was a lot of debate uh, happening, and it was very exciting. Because you guys saw, right? Like, it's a lot of RNG-ish stuff. Um, I feel like especially in our games, because we had a rogue with, like, double hallucinates, and um, we had a lot of discover mechanics. And sometimes it favored us, sometimes it didn't favor us, right? When we had two Antonituses, we were, as Rogue, we were not complaining. Um, when we got King Dread, we were complaining. So, uh, yeah, things happen. Um, and yeah, uh, I, I do want to ask a question, though. So we identified that... When it comes to sealed versus arena, you can make much better decks with sealed, even though they didn't even give you more cards. Like, they actually gave you, if you were to make a deck with, uh, you made like what, like three decks? That's 90 cards, right? Mm -hmm. They gave you yeah. 270 cards. It's like the same ratio as arena. 
But just the fact that you get to select which cards to put into what, and you don't have to make those like tough choices of like really all really bad cards or all really good cards, and you can always make sure you have a curb if you want it, and you can always make sure you have big cards if you want it, you can always make sure you have taunts if your deck needs that. It just creates a lot more strategy in deck building, right? Like I think this uh, this tournament and sealed in general is much more about deck building than it is about gameplay. Um. And that is in direct contrast to everything I believe in about the arena. In arena, I think deck building almost doesn't matter. Like, you can almost hand me any halfway decent deck, and I could probably get six wins per run average with it. Which, yeah. you know, if I normally average 7.5, that's not that far off, considering it's just someone giving me, like, a random deck that a, I don't know, like a, a four win per run player would make, or a three win per run player would make, right? And it's, like, generally okay. Uh, in sealed, if you gave me a deck a three win per uh, a, like three win per run, like the average player would make, versus a deck that like Kibler would make, I feel like it would be a huge difference in what I can do. Yeah, I definitely agree because um, when you are able to fine tune the deck, every additional card sort of exponent like every I'll call it quote correct card mm -hmm. right like. Um, exponentially like sort of increases the deck because you know you get this network effect right when you are able to create the, the a 30 card deck and hand select all 30 cards you're making sure each one of those cards helps the other ones right yep. whether it is a curve consideration or an actual synergy or sort of you know playing into one singular idea you know if it's a hunter it's like i gotta go face i need curve i need direct damage i need buffs i, I need all of this stuff like you know i need beast to activate my kill commands you just go like all of that helps you're not forced at one point to just say like man i gorilla bot is like i guess the best card here i'm taking a four <laughs> man at three four yeah, you're never forced it. into that yeah mm -hmm. yeah so uh, it, it, and I think, like, when it comes to... So, Temple Storm has this sealed... So, this whole thing is running off of Temple Storm. You're wondering, like, how do you do sealed? How do you open packs and, like, basic or whatever? Temple Storm has a simulator online um, that does this. And they've had it up for a while now. This is uh, Team Brawl number three. So, they, they've been doing this for a while. Um, and, uh, you know, Blizzard doesn't have a system like this. They don't have another limited format. And uh, I think it would be really interesting if Blizzard did. And if Blizzard did make a sealed format or something like a sealed format, I think it may be a little too like time intensive for people to build three decks. So in Magic the Gathering sealed formats, you build one deck, um, at least in the in the set and go tournaments that I played. So if Blizzard did something like that, and uh, you know put in next to the arena, um, I think it would be hugely popular. Because what do you do arena for, right? You do arena for the draft. Well, this is an even more intense way to draft, right? If you talk to, like, just the average arena player, your average 3-3 arena player, and you ask them what matters the most, they'll always say draft. Because they always feel like they're not winning or losing because they're making mistakes. Well, they are, but, like, most of it is because of how good or bad their cards are, or whether their opponent hits the ridiculous RNG, or whatever. And so they just feel like better cards will get them wins. And they're right, because the worse of a player you are, the more better cards impact your win rate. Right? Like, if you're really good, you can hedge against a lot of, like, seemingly eh kind of cards, and you can make them come together and do the things they need to do and secure the win. If you're bad, you just need that raw power, right? Good, like, RNG becomes a different, like, thing. Like, if you have a 60-40 RNG, that's great if you're a 50-50 player. Um, so, for most people, I think, if you make Sealed, which puts a lot more of the control of deck building into your hands and also makes the draft actually more important, you'll have a lot more support on that than, than in the arena, which to most people I think feels like a lot like you know a slot machine because they think the draft matters so much and then they don't control the draft that much, right? You can only control your draft so much in the arena. Uh, so I think it's a good, it's definitely going to be a good bridge if Blizzard ever goes that way and brings Sealed into Hearthstone. It would be a good bridge to get people from Constructed into the limited format. And back in, uh, back in Magic the Gathering, when I could play whatever I wanted to, uh, and there was a draft format, a sealed format, and a constructive format, I played sealed, right? I wasn't the draft player. I wasn't in a quote-unquote arena player, because that's more like arena than anything else. Um, I was a sealed player, and that's because I like deck building. Um, and I think most arena players like deck building, and that's why they play arena, is they can deck build each run. 
And Sealed would let you do the same thing, but have a way bigger impact. It would put shift the focus on something totally different. And you get to make these weird decks, right? You get to make these wacky decks. Um, and, and you get to see uh, more interesting games. So, on one hand, it does mean I think gameplay itself is a little less important. Um, but, hey, this is a card game, right? Building your deck is half the fun or more than half the fun. Yeah, in theory, and... unless you're a constructed player who net decks. And then I don't know why you're playing this game. But you are probably not listening to the Light Forge, so I can talk trash at you. Probably not. But it seems <clears> like Blizzard <throat> is still trying to figure out what they want to do with the arena. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the leaderboards is a start, but it's definitely not an end. Um, and it seems like with the leaderboards, they're trying to figure out, okay... How serious do we want the arena to be? Sort of like what it, it seems like arena, you know, they're tinkering with it, but they still don't know what the end game is. It's not right. like they're working towards an end game. No, no, they have no end game. They don't have they're, an they're end They're literally game adding right these rules in 7.1. That's because people complain too much about Flame Strike and Abyssal. Let's lower the odds on that. Like, that's literally what they're doing here. People complain that there's not enough spells. Let's make more spells. Like, I'm using like a, a patronizing voice because that's literally their thought process and that's been confirmed. Like this is not me making stuff up. This is just how so, they're thinking about it right now, which again for like baby steps is totally fine. You're resp you're literally responding to the community, right? You are very directly responding to the community, but it means you have no vision because the community has no vision. The community is a diverse set of people who all want something different and the loudest voices and the most, you know, people are average players. They, they'll they'll have certain demands and they don't have a vision for what they want the arena to be either because they are not a thing they are just a bunch of individual people who all happen to hit upon something like flame strike makes me feel bad right but they don't have a, a they're not building something right they're just tweaking things to make things a little bit better and so that's what blizzard's doing they're reacting to that yeah i don't know i i mean i think so we can talk about sealed but it, I think any talk is going to be a long ways off because I can't see Blizzard saying, hey, here's sealed, and then sort of not abandoning the arena, but then now you have two things that are sort of incomplete, right? Because arena right now is very much incomplete mm -hmm. uh, and without sort of... Um, th there's no clear path for it. And yep. if you come out with sealed, it'll suffer from the same problem at the very start. Yep. Um, it, it'll just give them something more to work on rather than something that they can just fine tune so so one of the things that blizzard may want to consider if they're not already considering is that they have all their eggs in one basket right now and that basket is constructed and when the constructed meta sucks you know what people do they don't just complain they stop playing like and i'm sure blizzard has the numbers to back this up when you have a bad meta in which people are not having fun uh, you know, right, right out of the gates on a on a uh, you know on a expansion is not the problem, right? People are still experimenting. Um, you know, good things are happening. You're still having fun with cards. You may be not even you may not even have a complete new deck yet, right? Like, not everyone has like a ton of gold and dust just sitting around, and not everyone wants to like dust half their collection uh, whenever mammoth rotation comes in. Uh, so uh, you're you're going to have an okay period. But they've also seen what happens when the meta was stale, when everyone's complaining about the Constructed meta. I'm sure it was not good for the number of people actually actively playing in Constructed. So when you make these different game modes, you also, you, you, the bad part is you dilute your pool. So now you have fewer Constructed players rather than just getting everyone in Constructed and then say, oh, and a couple of people play Arena and you can, you know, if you get sick of Constructed, you can go in the Arena, you know, get a breather, right? If they are actually splitting it up into Constructed and Sealed, uh, what's going to happen is when Constructed has a shitty meta, they'll have more time to respond to it. They'll have more time to develop a solution. Because in the meantime, people will play Sealed. Yep, people will play Arena. Right now, Arena is still not being taken too seriously. Um, and, you know, the, they can tweak stuff with that. But they need to diversify somehow. And having only one other option is not as good as having two other options. Even if they're not doing anything special with it. Just having something that keeps people in Hearthstone and keeps uh, keeps the player able to be building their collection while allowing Blizzard to make money or at least retain their player base. I think that's pretty useful at this stage. 
because we've seen a couple of bad constructed metas from what I hear. And Blizzard responds pretty slowly to these bad constructed metas from what I hear. And the constructed meta is pretty stale even in the best of cases, right? You're only facing a handful of decks against each other. So when it's yeah. bad, like it's real bad. No one's grinding that out unless they like, you know, really need to do something like I really need to make legend this season and this is a really strong deck or this is my job, so I'm playing. Basically. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I feel like Blizzard doesn't have a vision for the arena, but they don't necessarily need one before they make Sealed. I feel like it's okay if they have two like visionless things like kind of hanging out. Or maybe Blizzard is so confused about what to do with Arena, and they've had Arena around for three years now, that they could just be like, all right, we're just going to make Sealed and make that the like limited format that we actually take seriously. Because before we send it out, before we build it, we will have a vision for it. Whereas we never had a vision for Arena. We still don't know what to do with it. Just like kind of like let it be there and we'll keep tweaking it to make people have an okay experience. And to whoever wants to take it seriously, we'll, you know, progressively add more tools to it. But like really, we can create like a more fun and more balanced thing in Sealed. Like I can see them doing something like that. I can see that too. Um, I imagine that would be a while off though. Oh yeah, I mean it's not going to happen like next year or anything. Um, okay, let's move on to a question from the GOAT. Question from oh. the GOAT? Uh, question from the GOAT. All right, so even though we haven't played the meta in a while, all right, like, uh, I, hopefully this is not too... Uh, okay, I, I'm, I'm going to have to ask you to actually think about the game for a second. What? What? I thought we were going to do a fluffy one. I thought we agreed that question from the GOAT was going to be super fluffy. Yeah, and then I changed my mind. Oh, I didn't tell you. Oh, okay, okay, you know what? I'll have a question from the GOAT for you after your question from the GOAT, all right? Okay, okay, sure. Oh, interesting. All right, so, like, you have played with these uh, with these classes. Like, I think we've all played with the classes at least once, right, since Angoro has come out. Or at least I have. Have you? I have that played with all of the classes. Some of them were very short runs. Very, right. very short runs, and right. I don't think I have a good handle on these classes, but I have technically played with every class. So here's what here's my question, basically. Going with a class that needs help, so don't pick, like, rogue or mage or whatever. Um, you don't have to use code words, man. Like, go with warrior. I don't know why warrior. you're trying to. I don't know why you're trying to use a code well, word warrior, for warrior. I mean, even warlock, right? Warlock is not good. At it. Okay, fine. Um, warlock priest, they're not good. Shaman is okay, questionably so, good. Probably not. With one of these classes, bring back a card to help them out. Oh, you know? bring back a card that doesn't bring exist right now. Okay, them. warrior's easy. Death's bite. <laughs> so easy. It's like I don't even like the card, but it's very thematic. It fits a very useful slot, namely more weapon consistency for Warrior. Yeah. And it's a really powerful card, which is what they need, a really powerful card. And they also need Curve, and 4 is kind of a Curve, too. Yeah, yeah, I think... Basically, picking a weapon for, uh, you know, for Warrior is good. They just need more weapons, right? Yep. Like, even if you give them, like, King's Defender 2.0, they'll mm -hmm. take King's Defender 2.0. It's absolutely fine. It's a good weapon. Mm -hmm. Um... I say, man, like, playing Warlock after Angora has come out, I, like, I, I think I played two runs, and every single time, I'm like, I really want Power Overwhelm back. Yes. I think it belongs in the game. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not so powerful as to break the game, right? But it held the Warlock together. It gave them that tempo swing that they needed. And now that they don't have it, I don't know what Warlocks can do. Yep. They don't get on the board particularly that fast. They don't have any tempo plays, really. They just play very standard. Yep. And their minions are kind of weak for what they do. So, I don't know. Like, Warlock just feels weak and boring, so, which is the worst combination to have. My issue with Power Overwhelming is that it is actually just a broken card. Um... If you bring it back, you got to make it two mana. Uh, and that would be fine. Right. Like, that would be a fair card if it were two mana. Because the problem is, it deals four damage, and you need a body for it. For only one mana. Right. 
that's not like that's a very limited downside for dealing four damage. Like Soulfire is a really good card, and you have to discard a whole freaking card for it. Here, you just like need a minion on the board that is small enough uh, that that you like that either won't live after the trade or that you don't care if it dies after the trade, right? Like if you didn't also give it four health, it would not live after the trade, which especially yeah. for the warlock is like really easy to do. Uh, you no, don't even I have agree. to put in a token. So right. my issue is. Warlocks have cost, right? That's the whole warlock uh, like game design. Everything has a cost. You want to do something, you throw away cards. You want to do something, you break your mana crystals. You hurt yourself. You have to have a cost. There is no cost to Power Overwhelming. I think it's a poorly designed card because in theory, the cost is your minion dies. But in practice, that is not a cost because your minion would always die anyway. Whereas so what it's if, very, very hard to set up costless situations. Like, you have to have no hand in order to be able to discard nothing. Like, that doesn't happen too often, right? You have to, like, be in a situation where you would heal yourself anyway to have your life not matter, right? Or be, like, at very near full health. And your opponent's targeting your health pool. You have to be at 10 mana, so it takes 10 turns before you can get the mana crystal to not be a cost. But, like, just to lose a minion? No. No. I think what it needs to be is destroy a minion, give your other minion plus four plus four. Destroy a minion, give your other minion plus four plus four. Period. Or like give a give a minion like um, give target minion plus four plus four. Destroy a random minion on your side, and if you, you can only play it when you have uh, two minions. Oh, just dis- randomly destroy another minion. Yes, one of like, randomly sacrifice one of your minions. That that might make it more powerful. It might, but at least it has a cost now. And, and I don't oh, know. it's plus four, plus four for this turn only, obviously. Oh, oh, still only plus. Yeah, four, yeah, plus obviously four. for this turn only. But like your mini doesn't die, right? Because you have that, that, and that way the four health actually means something, right? Because it hits into something. If it doesn't die, then your minion, like it may lose right, the extra right, health, right. but it's still alive. So that four health actually has some meaning, rather That's than interesting being design. totally meaningless. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting design. So it's sort of like, um, okay, okay. So it's it's like a worse divine shield then, but it's warlock. So yes. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I I don't know. <laughs> or you can make it even more troll and just like have the word actually say kill a random minion, which means that it could possibly kill the minion it buffed, and then you get nothing from the card. That would sound like a warlock card right now. Right, that's a pretty troll yeah. card. Um, but, but that would still be, like, balanced. I'd, I'd be even okay if it exempted your, your guy. Like, if you had another minion on the board, it would always kill the other minion. See, the thing with Warlock is, uh, even if they just got the old power overwhelming back, I think it's absolutely fine. They're in such a bad spot Power-wise, right it's fine. But the card itself, like, that's the theory, right? Like, I never like adding totally broken cards just because a class is bad. You know? Like, I don't enjoy the fact that Warriors have Fool's Bane at all. Do they sure. need Fool's Bane? Yes. But it's not thematic to the warrior because it can't go face and it can hit multiple times. I don't really even care if it can hit multiple times, but it basically acts as a board clear and warriors don't do that very well. So it like creates like a three damage, like possibly split in weird ways board clear uh, that's not thematic of the warrior. It's a weapon that can't go face, which is like the opposite of what weapons do. Like that's the whole point of weapons, right? You can choose to hit a minion or the face. That's the whole like gameplay skill of the warrior. Like, I don't like it. It's just, it's not a well-designed card. Is it fair? I don't know. It, it, it's, like, really super powerful. But even if it wasn't powerful, it's not a well-designed card. I think you start with having well-designed cards, and then you worry about the power level. So, Power That's Overwhelming fair. is a poorly designed card. And it's too powerful. Like, it's it's failing on both situations. And it's only okay, because like you say, War- Warlock is in a really bad spot right now. Like, I thought Warlocks were going to be fine, but it is not. Like, we have we moved Warlock down from the Paladin level to the level of all the other classes below it. Yeah, um, and I think if you play Warlock these days, you, you have to get the perfect draft. And even if you do, I don't even know really what the perfect draft looks like. It's so specific, um, and it involves a lot of luck getting early minions um, because the offering rates, like, don't help you uh, specifically get, like... Um, all like get your curve uh, the way that you want it to. So yep. Uh, hmm. Um. Okay. So uh, oh, my question from the goat. This is the kind of fluffy question I thought we were going for. 
my question from the go to you is out of all the things we did in in LA uh you know at, at Red Bull and all the people we met what was your top fun experience top fun experience yeah. oh because like my we've gosh. seen some of these people before but we've never like you know like we haven't like we were like basically stuck in a hotel not stuck but like we're in a hotel and then we're in the Red Bull headquarters with like Trump and Kibler and Raynad and you know all these people for like three days almost yeah um man I had like that's you an know, experience people would kill for right all right so I'm sure whatever I miss you will bring up but mm -hmm. I'll bring up the uh, the last night um, in which uh, Adelton and I were invited by Trump and Temple Storm so uh, Raynad Trump Eloise and Frodan uh, to go to escape room um, and we went there. If you guys haven't done an escape room, you basically have a set amount of time for our room. It was 60 minutes uh, to sort of go into this room and solve all these puzzles and try to make your way out. Uh, we were invited uh, by Trump. And uh, I, I mean, it was just a great time. It was lots of fun. Um, they actually took us out to dinner first. We ate ramen. Uh, we went there. We solved puzzles together. Um, we just had a blast. And it was just cool hanging out with these people um, and just... I don't know, just, like, yeah, forget about Hearthstone. Because, yeah. like, when you're about, hanging like, out with tournament. people, it's not like, you know, that's not, like, necessarily Trump, Trump, right? Like, or, like, Raynad, right. Raynad, or, like, Frodad, master of all things, right? Like, they, they're, they're just people, right? We're just hanging out. And it was uh, it was really cool. Yeah, I, it was I thought that was really cool. nice of them. Like, they didn't have to invite us. They could have just made it a Tempo Storm bonding experience, yeah. right? Like, it's definitely doable with four people, <laughs> uh, but they... Uh, wanted uh they had room for two more so they invited us along we we're uh, extremely thankful for that uh watching watching uh, so like the escape room turned from like a normal escape room into a more scary escape room halfway through with no warning and watching eloise get scared was hilarious well she was tired before <laughs> then then she definitely woke up afterwards <laughs> uh okay so i think my favorite experience is and i don't know how much of this actually got caught uh like it was actually shown in on the twitch thing but pretty much every time people got a break Everyone was playing this game called Code Words. Like, Code, uh, code yeah, Word? Uh, code Names. Code, code names, names. Code Names. Everyone was playing this game. I never played this game before. I never even heard of this game before. Um, but it's basically like someone gives clues and you have some words and you have to select words that match it. But it's a very... it's and, and the clue you give has to just be one word and a number. So it's like very limiting and you have to like get into people's heads. And like everybody played it. Uh, so it was a really, it was really cool to just like have a whole bunch of Hearthstone players sitting there, like trying to play a different game, technically a card game, but not really. Um, and it's, you know, fun, fun kind of like party game. And also like at the right dorkiness level, like no one was trying to be cooler than, uh, than, than the crowd. Right. Uh, and it just, it happened very consistently. You know, we played a, a number, a number of games with, of it, with everybody. And it was, I thought that was really fun. Right. Um, and and I, thought, I think it was just a good mix. Like mm -hmm. what Red Bull, I think what Red Bull was going for was inviting people that uh, weren't just sort of well-known in the industry, but could bring some personality, yeah. right? Uh, bring some, you, you know, br bring a twist. You know, we, like mm -hmm. we were the arena team, but uh, I think, uh, you know, we were also there to just entertain as well, right? Um, and the whole entire sort of uh, the whole entire vibe I got was, you know, like, these are just fun people. And then when put together, like, yeah. everyone was extremely inviting, uh, extremely hospitable. And, like, during the game, like, I, I had no no idea what it was. But as I walked by, people were just like, hey, you should join. You should play this. And, you know, people explained the rules. And when more people walk by, like, the whole entire group would invite them to play. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was just like it made the whole entire experience like so much better because yeah. of everyone's like uh friendliness and hospitality yeah like it definitely wasn't and i'm sure this came through on the twitch thing it wasn't like everyone was just in their room screaming the whole entire time like trying to figure out like you know the best way i mean we were a lot of the times but you know also even like just the night before the tournament right like we were we were playing code names <laughs> And, uh, and when we were cool. watching, we were watching the finals after we got uh, kicked out. We were playing code names and watching watching the finals. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I thought that was really cool. And I'm still triggered, by the way. If if you're listening to this, Trump, I'm still triggered because the word the word association was mammal two, and there was a cat on the board, and then there was an octopus, a snail, a duck, and some other things. And Trump just like refused to let anybody pick anything except duck because he knew that the duck was a mammal 
and he was ducks right. Ducks are not mammals, by the ducks, way. In case you're listening, you don't know ducks are very much birds, very much not mammals. But just the confidence, just the confidence and the absolute certainty that our clue giver thought that the duck was a mammal. Trump, he is a seasoned vet, okay? <laughs> and that, like, okay, Trump is, like, the... He is like the the omega, the absolute in that game. Like he is a hundred percent confident in his skills, and my gosh, he got he nailed that one. No, yeah. Raynad and I are on the same team, and we were so triggered afterwards. We we're like, I, I can't. How do you how do you interpret clues after that? After duck becomes mammal. Okay. Anyway, moving on. Let's talk about arena related stuff again. March leaderboard. It right. happened, and guess who made it? Our very own Murps at seven point five something. Uh, seven point five seven. Seven point five seven, which just like my seven point five something was not our actual average, but Blizzard decided that was going to be our average, and it's close enough, so it's fine. It's close <laughs> enough. I don't. I actually don't know how they got this. No, number. no, no. I, I, there's I no never, way. I actually never got this number. No, it's not a real number. It's like they add random runs to it. Remember how last uh, last month that there was this whole thing where they added zero three to like a bunch of people's runs, right? Like for no reason until they were called out on it. Like it, my average is still not right for for February. It's just it, even if they fixed it, I would be like number seven or something instead of nine. So I don't care. Um, but <laughs> congratulations to Murps number fifteen, tied with like five other people, and yep. uh, by the grace of Blizzard. You lost all those tiebreakers, however they broke it. <laughs> I did. <laughs> like, it wasn't alphabetical did. order. I don't know what order is. Maybe it's in order that these people made their accounts, or, like, the last run or the first run that they did. But Merz is dead last of five equal numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, sucks to suck, man. <laughs> you could have been number roll. 11, but you were number 15. It's all right. I can go roll during the tournament. <laughs> I can go roll during, uh, during the leaderboards. But it doesn't really matter. Mm. Um but first of all, uh, on North America, uh, I'm, I'm going to, even though I don't know this person, uh, congrats to number one, Jane Love, with an 8.23 average, you know. Very impressive. Very impressive. You know, g- going down, uh, I see some familiar uh, names. Uh, Fleetwood, right, another yeah. streamer uh, at number nine. Uh, big congrats to Fleetwood. Uh, and obviously, we see, like, the Meow Clan uh, sort of, <laughs> you know, uh, sprinkled here throughout. Mm-hmm. Um, but we have Isherwood at 14 beating me out, even though we have the same record. Hashtag not bitter. <laughs> uh, congrats to Isher. Um, who didn't has didn't Isher get on our stream and like take you to a two two win run or something like that? He did, oh, and that counted. It counted. Oh, Look at that sabotage. Counted. He's I like, go oh man, I'm gonna do time. I'm gonna do co op. You know, I'm gonna help you out. You seem a little tired. Oh yeah. <laughs> Damn it, Isherwood. He got me. Um, he got me, and he edged me out. Yeah. That was the tiebreaker right there. If that won three wins, you would have been number 10. Oh, sorry, 11. I would have. Oh, anyways, going down, and excuse me if I've missed some people, uh, but it, it's it, it's hard to get everyone. This is Also, I, I don't know like everyone's names, but yeah. number 35 is... Zevron is actually a Maz. Uh, so congrats oh, to Oh yeah, Maz. that was the bet with Hafu that Hafu actually lost. Okay, yeah, so if you guys lost. don't know the story, Hafu bet a Maz before the season started that she would beat him in the arena leaderboard, which seems like a real no-brainer. Um, you know, not because Maz is a crappy player, but because Maz barely plays arena and has historically not averaged seven wins per run. Uh, whereas Hafu average what got like eight win more than eight wins per run, you know, the the month before that. And yeah, uh, where, where's Hafu? Uh, where, where's both Hafus this uh, this month? Both Hafus are at seventy five and eighty nine. Okay, so, so Amaz actually beat Hafu, and Hafu yeah. is actually going to have to give him a thousand dollars. This is like Hafu already gave him. Oh, like already gave him a thousand dollars. Okay, and this, by the way, like this is like Hafu's worst performance, I, I think in like the entire history of any month she's played Arena. Like I've been watching her for like two, two and a half years, three years. I, I don't, and I've been tracking her record because she's one of the few people who actually like publicizes her record. It was like her and Trump, and no one else publicized their record. And she has, I don't, I have no memory of her ever dropping anywhere near to that like number. Right. But uh, seven point one, man. Seven point one. That's the seven point one meta for you. 
it's a perfect storm, you mm-hmm. know? Uh, also, Crip came in at number 67. Mm-hmm. Um, with, uh, you know, ba- basically a flat 7.0 average. Nice. Um, I think we all sort of felt the wrath of 7.1, yep. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, bringing up the rear, we actually have Victor uh, at 6.9 at number 99. Ooh, um, nice. Yeah, he was not expecting to be on the leaderboard, and I'm sure he's not happy. Just like the time when I was 90, (laughs) I'm sure he's not happy about being 99. (laughs) But uh, he is on here with 106 runs. Damn. um, Yeah. Right. Remember when he was on here, he's like, so I've played like 30 runs so far, and we're like, it's been one week into the new meta. Right. What do you mean? (laughs) And Victor plays at EU all the time as well. Mm -hmm. So, right. Uh, This is just... (laughs) This is Victor, uh, which uh, I'm sure he, I'm sure if we asked him, he'd be like, yeah, I, I don't want you guys talking about it, but uh, <laughs> uh, congratulations. And, yeah, and because you didn't bring it up, I thought we were going to link to it. The, when we're talking about two Hafus, the other Hafu is not really Hafu, it's Trump. No, no, no. So, Wait, it's uh, not Trump? I thought it was Trump. Is it actually Hafu's other account? Oh, no, no, no. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I think this one is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. this one is. It is Trump, right? So yes, yes. for some reason, Blizzard decided to call Hafu. So, so what we do is you can contact Blizzard, like if you like tweet at Ixar or whatever, and you don't want your actual screen name to be revealed and you want it to be like something else, you just tell them if you think you're going to be on the leaderboard and they put whatever name you want on there, um, you know, assuming it's appropriate and all that. So, you know, my name is not Adwikta, um, but it shows as Adwikta on the leaderboard. Uh, for some reason, they thought that whatever name Trump was using was actually Hafu's account. So, it's Hafu on there. Yep. Anyways, that's the leaderboard for North America. Um, just jumping to EU for one second. I want to say congrats to number one, which is Tim Roo. I don't know who Tim Roo is, but congrats to Tim Roo with 8.9 average. Damn, really almost sick. joining the nine win club. That's like yes. Chucky level. 8.9. Uh, and uh, a, a couple of familiar faces I want to mention. Uh, our very own Dr. Stein at number 10. Nice. Huge congrats to uh, Dr. Stein. Uh, played 57 runs. Obviously not modding enough if he's, he's uh, <laughs> playing that many no, runs. No, it means we're so. not streaming enough for him to be occupied with the mod. Oh, he could be doing other stuff. We, you, you know, he could he could be doing quite a lot for, for the stream when we're not streaming. So Dr. Stein... Get on that. And also Isher, once again, at 26. So Isher, you know, placing very well this month on both uh, both servers. Big congrats to Isher. Uh, basically, number 14 on NA, hashtag still not bitter. And 26 on EU. That shows, I mean, such consistency, yep. right? And he did Asia last time, right? He was number one in Asia last he time. He's number one Asia. Really making a name so, out yeah. for himself. He's just, no, he's just coming around and like... You try to figure out different metas, right? It's a good way to learn. Yep. Uh, so that's basically it. Um, and there's like the Asian leaderboards, but we don't really do we know anyone those. in there. Yeah. Did, did anyone and do the issue with thing and go in and try to take number one? I can't even see it right now. <laughs> okay. So. It's actually really hard to find these different ones when you're not in the region. Yeah, um, it, it actually is. But. But yeah, okay. congratulations to everyone especially if you made it through 7.1 congratulations to you. if you were able to play 30 runs in 7.1 we feel for you um yeah and especially like all these people they're all good great arena players which means they all hated 7.1 at least after the first week or two they all hated 7.1 and uh they all made it so congrats um me and Murps are not going for the leaderboard this month like march just not happening we don't have enough time to, to get 30 runs in, um, and it's also a huge transition meta with Angoro coming in. It's April, by the way. Sorry, April. God, time passes fast. Um, yeah, so... Oh, wow, tax day's tomorrow. I gotta do that. Um, okay, uh, re- reminder, if you're listening to this um, on Tuesday, it's tax day. You should go put your taxes in if you are in the U.S. Uh, okay. So, uh, we're not going to be on the leaderboard this next month, and then we'll see about May. I may do it in May. I have a week off in May uh, for, for moving, so I may have some downtime then. Um, but yeah, but if not May, then we're definitely doing June. So, uh, we're, we're skipping this, both of us are skipping this, uh, this next leaderboard. 
Um, and again, uh, it's, a, it's a fun thing for the leaderboard. I think the people who are at the top do like amazing things. I'm still... I, I just really want to get 8 wins per run. I don't know if I can do it in the Angoro meta. Uh, the way that I could have in prior metas. Because after 7.1 came out, it really like changed things. Um, but like that's my personal... That's my personal goal. It's not to be in any particular slot. It's just to get the 8.0 that I thought I could get, but I didn't quite make in uh, in February. I think this month will be uh, sort of sort of telling, right? Um, in, in terms of wait, actually, when did the expansion come out again? The expansion came out in this month. This month is not going to be telling at all. Like if you oh, spam 30 mind. runs in the never first mind. week, you're going to have 10 wins per run. Yeah, yeah. No, ne never mind. Um, I'm telling you, this but... is what we need to do. We need to share an account called the Grid and Goat, and when the next expansion comes out, just both take a week off from work and then trade off on playing that account and get all thirty runs, and then just you know. It's not even a week because uh, after the first, because if the expansion comes out on Thursday, yeah, so we'll take want... yeah, well we'll take it's that Thursday, Friday, and then the weekend, right? And then the weekend. So yeah, so you it. only have to take two days off. We should do it. Great, this is a great idea. We should I do it. Don't need to live for those four days what no you can only have to play half the time i'll be playing the other half it's 12 oh, hours God. it's like uh it's just like you know having a job that's you know working you overtime Sounds and it'll be terrible. fun no uh i think people should do that though like because you you can get like 10 wins per run like feasibly in in that meta and you definitely can't get 10 wins per run outside of that meta. Like, 9's ridiculous. I don't know how people pull out these, like, 9, 9.4 numbers or anything like that. Right. Like, Victor admitted um, he found, you know, he found a weakness, right? Mm -hmm. Like, everyone was drafting Greedy Warlock, so he played any sort of hunter and just yep. beat them in the face. Yeah. Um, and that's how he got, like, his yep. 9.3. Yeah, because he got that not in a transition meta at all. Like, the, the expansion had already been released for a month. When uh, when he started, uh, when when January started. Yep. Uh, all all right. right. So finally, let's do uh, wrap this up. Do card good bad. All right. Now we're actually going to talk about the uh, the Angoro Arena meta. Uh, last time with card good bad, we did the uh, double adapt people, which is vicious fledgling and volcanosaur, and we talked about how that mechanic works. Today we're going to talk about the best card. In the arena. So since the last time um, that we did the Light Forge, we have updated the tier list like twice. Um, and there's a lot of updates that have actually no, we've updated it once. We've updated it once, and uh, it just got updated. We're gonna update it again in a, in a couple days with some more tweaks. But it, the tweaks are getting smaller and smaller, right? The big one happened last week. Um, the one that just came in was like murlocs got upped a little because we realized the murloc synergies were actually a thing um pirates got knocked down a little because of galaka crawler could totally ruin your run like it's it's a little stuff like that um but the main change was that high attack taunt minions with low health we changed the we, we made the taunt uh formula much more sophisticated for those and so some of those fell but there's not a lot of high attack taunt people, right? You have like your like higher gun, which only has one more attack than health, and you're like pompous thespian. The one that really hurts is the snail, right? Because that technically has like a whole ton of attack. And so snail right now has been moved to be one point below the wasp. But in my book, he's basically a wasp. So this is what a lot of people were thinking from the very beginning. And we had gone with the snail and we had rated the snail high. And um, we, we, we've now come to the point where we're like, yeah, there's just way too many two damage removals in the game. Like, the snail does get removed by pretty much anything. And one damage if you're facing rogue or mage, which you're facing a lot. So uh, the snail does not stay up quite as much as we kind of want the snail to. Uh, it's still very good. It's still wasp level, but it is now no longer above wasp. It's definitely no longer 10 points above wasp. Uh, and... Which leaves one more card all alone at the top. This card was always above Snail, but now it is definitely head and shoulders above Snail. It is head and shoulders above Wasp. It is the best card that is not a legendary in Angoro. Primordial Drake at 141. It hasn't, the score hasn't changed, but because Snail moved, this card is now just so far and ahead uh, the best card. And I think people feel it, right? Like... How many times have you been destroyed by Primordial Drake? 
Oh, God. It's gotten to the point where against every single class, if I see them holding onto a card for a while, I'm just thinking, man, turn eight, I got to prepare for a Primordial Drake. But it's one of those cards in which even if I prepare for, what do you do? Because even if you set it up so that you don't get full cleared by Primordial Drake, it's a 4-8 taunt, which is so annoying. Um, like, not only does it deal the AoE, it... It's almost like a follow-up AoE, right? Because uh, the 4A Taunt is so sturdy and so annoying. Um, it's just a powerhouse of a card. And like I've lost to it so many times. I've won games because of it so many times as well. Um, and it just perfectly embodies what N'Goro does. Um, sort of big minion that also taunts, that also has ridiculous power creep over a card we've seen previously uh you mm -hmm. know the uh, corrupted seer I'm, I'm gonna say go put, put one more into this i think it perfectly counters what ungoro does because what ungoro does is it stalls your board out and puts a whole bunch of crap and everything's injured that's ungoro yeah. and you know what punishes that when you deal damage sleep to with the fishes yeah sleep with the fishes <laughs> but you also kill all the things that are low and then you bring all the things that were not low too low enough that you perfectly taunt it with your four damage and your eight health it's just such a perfect sad distribution on such a perfect card, and it is. It's like, um, it, it is the best card by far in this meta that is a neutral. Um, so, what do we do? Uh, let's, let's take it from the perspective first of you have a Primordial Drake. When do you play it? Like, uh, one of the things that we always bring up is um, a lot of these cards that have an ability that is even like a purely beneficial ability, like a Gluttonous Ooze, for example, right? which destroys a weapon and then gives you health for it, like, that's just a pure upside. It performs worse than, like, neutral 3-3s. Three in, yeah. in average uh, player stats. And then this is a pattern. You see it with, like, the other oozes. You see it with, like, a whole bunch of cards where you're just like, well, this one just has a pure upside play. How can it possibly be worse? And it is. And it's worse because that particular upside play makes people hold on to the card for way too long and not play it for tempo. So... With a card like Primordial Drake, which is, you know, not a pure upside play, because it also hurts your own side of the board, and it's an 8-mana card, and it could get such insane value, or it could get very little value, or it could just be a super over, like, you know, over-costed 4-8 taunt. Like, when do you play this guy? When is the right time to play a Primordial Drake if you have it? How do you not be a 3-win-per-run average player and have abilities hurt you? All right, so step one, you should consider the board when you play it. I don't know how simple you, simple you want me to get here in terms of this explanation. Okay, so besides when obviously it's a perfect time to play it, right? Like, I think if you can if you can kill two of your opponent's, like, legit threats... Right. You should uh, Without sacrificing one of your own, you should obviously play it. That's obviously powerful enough. Yeah. So I, th I think what you're trying to get at here is I would play it when... I am able to sort of make sure that um, the AoE plus the body is able to get what I I expect to get with eight mana, right? Mm. Uh, or in fact, a little bit more. A little bit more because it's a premium card. Because it's a premium card. So, for an example, if there is like uh, it, basically by the time you play Primordial Drake, if it kills off something with two health. And what's left is what took them sort of like 10 mana to put out there. I'm like, okay, that's that's a good Primordial Drake, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because you remove something, uh, whether it's like 2 or 3 mana, and they have like 10 mana's worth of stuff that they've committed out onto the board, which because of your 2 damage AoE plus the 4 8 taunt, uh, you know, you are you should be able to clear that. That's like a very good Primordial Drake. And it should be more than 8 mana also, just because you can't totally rely on the Primordial Drake, right? Yep. Um, so it, it's you put it out there and... It can get removed. It, it can right. get soft removed. It can get removed, like hard removed or soft removed, and you want it to have the upside so that if they don't have it, you sort of capitalize on it a little bit more. Um, so that's sort of the situation in which you're happy to use it. Uh, sometimes, unfortunately, you just have to use it because it's a taunt and you really need a taunt. Um, and that's fine. I mean, a 4 8 taunt is pretty freaking good, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for 
basically two less mana you uh that's an ancient of blossoms right like no. and it even has one less stats and it doesn't have the aoe so um with primordial drake you're trying to get that value but other than that you you also don't want to be the guy that holds on to it for way too long and yep. assume that the board will automatically get better because mm -hmm. as you give up an opportunity that's another opportunity for your opponent to create a worse board mm -hmm. for the primordial drink because at the end of the day you're going into turn eight turn nine turn ten it's only a two damage aoe which matters less and less right yep so get the value when you can but don't be that guy who holds back on the gluttonous ooze <laughs> and who holds back on the primordial drake and then suddenly faces a board of like ultra sores and border fist ogres and your two damage aoe does absolutely nothing yeah you got four more damage on it than you otherwise would have you're going to lose yeah um the one more, more uh one, to add on to that the other time you play the primordial drake uh is when you need a taunt because you know what Primordial Drake is? It's a 4-8 taunt. And sometimes you just need a 4-8 taunt. Damn what the 2 damage board clear can actually do. Here's what happens when you don't taunt something. Alright? They have a 3-3. It hits your face. They have a 3-3 the next turn too. Where it's still not good for Primordial Drake. It hits your face again. They have a 3-3 the turn after that still. It's hitting your face again. And boom! You've lost 9 health. And if you had played the Primordial Drake... It would have taunted the 3-3, which even if he hit the 3-3 in and like, I don't know, like a 5-5 five, five or something, and you like didn't get terribly am high amounts of value, you have at least prevented that damage from going to your face. You have saved yourself 9 face damage. Like, that is very important if it can kill the minion at any point. Or if you have some follow-up that would kill the minion. Because minions that stay on the board, that when you're not taunting, keep hitting your face. And sometimes your face is important. Um, whether because your opponent is a hunter or if your opponent looks like he's just trying to be really aggro. Primordial Drake, even if the two damage doesn't kill anything, is still a 4 8 taunt. And that will mess up your opponent's aggro plans. Like, not super aggro, because then it's already turn 8, but like their mid range aggro. It will mess it up. So if you see your opponent start be just like flooding the board and being like, ah, I'm going for it, even if everything they have is at 3 health, you can play it. Trade it for like two or three of their like three three minions that become three one, and feel okay about it, because yep. otherwise you lose. The thing with Primordial Drake and the thing with any big bomb is that you want to play it in order to avoid losing and to win the game. This sounds really simple, but a lot of people try to hold it even if it gets less and less likely that this card will win you the game or prevent you from losing. So that's the way to like really measure the like if you have enough game sense for it, that's the way to really measure the worth of this card and when to play it. Okay, so now do you play against the Primordial Drake? It's the best card in the game. It is an epic. It is offered uh, 0.4 times per uh, per per draft. So that means half of your opponents will have one in their deck, which means yeah. I don't know, like a quarter of your opponents will draw one at some point when the game is still on the line i mean look it, it the situation is sort of like all these powerful cards um i play around it when it doesn't inconvenience me too much right i certainly prepare for big taunts basically just starting from like you know like turn six or turn seven right because mm -hmm. that's just what ungoral does you just taunt stuff up now whether or not it's a taunt that we've seen uh for you know since classic like sunwalker um you know, uh, an old god's taunt like Bog Creeper or, you know, we see like Mastodons now, right? Uh, on turn nine, you can sort of prepare for these. Um, but with Primordial Drake, it's obviously a little bit different. I play around it whenever it doesn't severely uh, sort of inconvenience me. And also, I just look at their hand, right? If they've kept something for a long time and they haven't played it, I'm just like, well, there's a good chance it's like a really big card. Yes. And... It, here's the way I think about it, right? If it's something even bigger, but more useless, like an Ultrasaur or sometimes even like a Mastodon, I'm just like, that's fine, right? It doesn't, it's not as bad as getting cleared and taunted by a Primordial mm -hmm. Dream. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, do I play around it? Yes. Um, but do I always have the luxury of playing around it? Uh, no. Mm -hmm. I think this is definitely a card you play around. Uh, 
to the extent that you can. And it becomes even bigger of a card that you play around if you're facing any class that also has a board clear. Like, another board clear. Because now you're not just playing around Primordial Drake. Now you're also playing around, like, Primordial Drake, Volcanic Potion, um, yeah, also Blizzard, right? Like, you play around all three of those cards the same exact way. So, do you play around this card specifically? Sometimes, like, depending on how, you know, depending on how, if you have the luxury to do so. But you play around two damage board clears? Yes. Against Mage? Definitely yes. Right? Against Paladin? Definitely yes. Against Rogue? They still have Fan of Knives. It may not be two damage, but you throw a dagger in there with some pings and it might as well be two damage. Druids still have Swipe with their hero power. Like, almost, like, Priest have Holy Nova, Shaman have Lightning Storm. Uh, although Shaman, it's hard to play around anything because they also have Volcano. Uh, uh, like, Warrior aside, I don't know that there's any class right now that you don't play around. Like, maybe Hunter, right? Like, maybe Hunter. But Hunter has Grievous Bite, which is, like, very similar. You just generally want to play around that, like, 1, 2, 3 damage board clear. Um... And Primordial Drake fits into that. So do you play around Primordial Drake specifically? Highly questionable. But you do play around it generally. Because you're playing around a lot more cards than just Primordial Drake. And you play around all of them the same way. Yep. So that's Primordial Drake. And that's it for this episode of the Light Forge. We will be back with a very detailed Angoro meta breakdown on where the meta has settled and what you do with it. Um... Next week, uh, we'll be playing a lot this week. And so, thank you guys for listening. Until next time, uh, this is Adwukta. This is Murps. See you guys.